Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you all for coming. It's great, great to be together, and we're so happy to have Dr. Christine with us today. Yeah. And from here in Colorado. Yep. And it sounds like a lot of you have collaborated together. So, what a fortuitous thing for us all to have this chance to come together and to learn from you. Um, BIOS, our efforts in BIOS are to just examine different ways to bring all kinds of research together with athletics. And so many people are doing that so well on our campus, throughout our campus, and have been doing it for many years. And so any chances we have to come together um, to talk about research and athletics are awesome. So thank you all for being here. And uh, if you ever want to learn more about what we're doing BIOS, we're located one floor down, the third floor on the corner there. You're always welcome to stop by. Maria leads the way for us each day there. So Christine, thank you for being here. We're excited to learn from you. Thanks uh, a lot. Thank you. Thank you so we have a group on Zoom here as well. Hello, Zoom. Um, uh, I just really appreciate the opportunity. And I, I'm going to give myself a quick intro, but mostly I want to hear who's in the room, um, just so I can tailor this as best I can to y'all. So I come into this um, present role as researcher. As a former varsity athlete, I was a rower. I worked in um, the concussion space doing long and short term implications of concussion traumatic brain injury. From and now I do more health policy research, thinking about macro systems and structure and athlete healthcare. Okay, that's kind of my background and training. If we can get like just two seconds on each of you, I would really appreciate that name role. I'll start with you. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. Kevin Schultz, director of the Olympic Stream Leadership. Awesome. Uh, Tracy Schindler, uh, director of Camp Administration and Youth Protection. Okay. Uh, I'm Jason Lopez. I'm a professor in Com Arts. I study sports media. Awesome. We're Andrew Levinson. I'm a graduate student at Home Island Labs. Wonderful. Oh, um, T. Anderson, assistant strength conditioning coach. Yeah. Uh, Sawyer Sarbacher, grad assistant strength conditioning coach. Oh, Michael Walter, I mean, we're speaking in the and then director of the athletic training and education program. I'm a Randra. I'm a uh, grad student. Um, right with Rowan. Uh, I'm Liz, I'm a research engineer. Um, Claire, I'm a clinical research coordinator for the Advanced Athletics and Sports Club. Okay. And then we have a blow up for you. Cool. Herman Feller, also a research coordinator for Advanced Athletics and Sports Club. Okay. Ray Daynard, Associate Director of BIOS. Tony Stam, uh, clinical professor in anatomy and kinesiology. Cool. I'm Pete Miller, I'm a professor in the School of Education and work with BIOS as well. Wonderful. What I mean, what an awesome group. So thanks for having me. Um, as you can see, sport touches all kinds of disciplines, professions, and people, right? And I think that's one of the things that really draws me to the area. What I'm hoping for today is to talk to you a little bit about medical decision making in sport. So what is that? What do I mean? Um, to talk about some challenges we face in medical decision making in sport in general, or in, in general in medical decision making, and then in sport in particular to kind of put out there the model of shared decision-making as a potential or partial solution for some of the challenges we face in providing high quality care to athletes. And then think about some ethical considerations and future directions that might frame all of those um, first three things. Okay, so that's my goal. So what is medical, medical decision-making? Um, you know, if we're gonna go kind of by a textbook definition, medical decision-making is the process by which a diagnosis or treatment plan is formulated from the available test information, often with the incorporation of known patient preferences. Pretty dry. Um, but there's kind of a lot that goes into it, right? If you think about a pretty complex situation where an athlete faces an injury, they need to decide whether or not to disclose that injury to a healthcare professional, what goes into that choice? The healthcare professional then has to make some assessment to come up with an injury diagnosis and potential management plan. How does that process happen? Right from there, what values from the athlete side, what background and history from the athlete side, what values, background and history from the clinician side and from the full environment of the athletics context come into and potentially influence that decision-making process. Is that a shared decision-making process? Is the value uh, proposition from the athlete side heard, right? There's a lot of little pieces that go into this relatively simple or could be seemingly simple process, right? And some of those are general features that make medical decision-making anywhere complex. And some of those things are really particular to the athletics context. So let's start with um, the front side of this. 
I kind of preface this by saying an athlete has an injury, they need to make a decision about whether or not to disclose. In general healthcare, medical decision-making pretty much begins at the clinical encounter, right? We don't think about before the patient walks into the office of the doctor, walks into the hospital. Really, in other contexts, that's the beginning. In athletics, because of this pre-existing relationship, because of the nature of the structure of sports medicine within perhaps a university, within an athletics context, we're kind of thinking upstream as a preventative approach for, welcome, um, for um, beginning this initiation of medical decision-making from the athlete side. How do I decide as an athlete whether or not I'm comfortable disclosing an injury to my healthcare provider or team? So, there's been, for example, a huge literature in the concussion space, which is sort of where I started about how those decisions get made. What factors influence those decisions from the athlete side, from the environmental piece, from the clinician side? Nice to see you. Um, so things like social norms. What do I think my teammates would think of me if I, if I took this action or this behavior? Um, those can be real social norms, meaning uh, I, I know what would happen, or they can be perceived. I kind of have seen what other people have done, how my teammates have reacted in other situations. I can therefore infer what might happen in my context. A ton of different pressures from stakeholders, from the athlete themselves, right? They have a drive. That's how you become a college athlete, right? You have some sort of internal drive um, for success in that domain. But then there is external pressures, right, from a coach maybe from teammates, maybe that's part of those social norms calculations from you know, uh, family or fans or the big game, right? There's all of these external pressures that might come both from the athlete side, but we can also imagine those on the clinician side as well, right? I need to get the athlete back for the game. The coach really wants the athlete back for the game. There's all these incentive structures and perceived costs and benefits. Some of those are pressures, but some of those are you know, maybe uh, perceived positive, um, positive attributes of either disclosing the injury. If I disclose this one, I know because I've been educated by my medical staff that maybe I won't get another one. I'll re recover more quickly. I won't have that delayed reaction time, right? I will maybe prevent a lower extremity injury from that delayed reaction time um, from occurring. There's also maybe some career type benefits. People who play sports here have aspirations of continuing to play sport perhaps, right? So a benefit of um, maybe withholding the injury, perceived benefit of withholding the injury from the athlete side might be, you know, I don't want my professional, potential professional team to know I have this injury that might deter them from drafting me or something like that. On the other side, you know, if you, um, Get that injury recovered more quickly, then the perceived benefit is you can be seen as having fully recovered on the backside of that injury, right? So some kind of flip side costs and benefits. We've seen that a history of concussion um, predicts future concussion reporting behavior. So there's like a lot of factors. I'm guessing you guys are getting the drift, right? There's a whole bunch of things that go into the upside of the clinical or the front side of, before the clinical encounter even begins, before where the rest of healthcare starts to think about medical decision making. And a lot of these things, not all of them, a lot of them have, um, there are things that universities, clinicians, coaches, teammates can do to influence that first step, right? Creating a culture of um, a pro-health culture, a pro-health and safety culture, having a sports medicine staff that, um, you know, I was talking to Andy's class uh, yesterday and he was like, when I was an athletic trainer, my, my athletic training room was Switzerland, right? It is neutral. You come through the door and this is about healthcare. We focus on healthcare. We focus on you as the patient. We make sure that your needs, your values, your health is the priority, right? We kind of close the doors to the athletics context in a, little, in a, in a certain way. Um, making sure that there is a trusting relationship between clinicians and athletes, between coaches and athletes, between other athletics staff and athletes such that they feel safe and reporting those injuries, right? All those kinds of things influence that first step. So the first step to challenge, the, the first challenge to medical decision-making in the athletics context is identification. Now, sometimes that's easier and sometimes that's harder. If somebody tears an ACL in the middle of the game, you're going to see it, right? Not all medical decision-making in the context of sport requires that first active step on athletes, but many of them do. 
and many of them continue to in the sense that athletes need to honestly participate in their care delivery. They need to disclose their symptomology. They need to continue to participate in the therapies that help them get better, all those kinds of things, right? It's not a single time point, it's a process. But that first step here, one that is pretty unique to athletics is before we even get in the door, there's a lot of steps there that are at least somewhat in the control of the athletics environment and those who participate in it. Okay, we're coming in the door, right? The athlete has decided, they've walked in the door and now we have a process, emphasis on that, right? By which a diagnosis or treatment plan is formulated. There's a lot that can go into that piece as well. So starting from the athlete side, there's a ton that we know about athletes in particular, but human beings in general, that we're just like not always that good at making decisions about risks and benefits. We're not. There's a lot of cognitive biases that every single one of us, some more than others, athletes included, have when they're thinking about weighing risks and benefits, future versus now, et cetera. So some of those include we tend to, we athletes, pretty much all of us, men more than women, you know, people who participate in the activity more so than people who don't, um, underestimate our personal risks. I don't think the bad thing's gonna happen to me. It might happen to somebody else. I know that there is a risk, but like the risk for me, hmm, I don't think so, not so much, right? Like you have this first person bias and that influences athlete perceptions about going back post-injury uh, at a, you know, what their risk profile might look like. I had this thing, you know, everybody has a risk of this thing once in their career, mine's done. You know, this isn't a risk for me anymore. Not exactly accurate, but it is um, just a piece of decision-making that comes into play for athletes in this context, as well as for most people. Um, so I did a study that kind of substantiated that in football players, underestimating their personal risk of concussion as well as other injuries. We all have these kind of two modes of decision-making. Um, uh, Kahneman, um, Daniel Kahneman, a really famous behavioral economist calls, calls them thinking fast or thinking slow, type one or type two thinking. You might have heard of these things before. Um, type one thinking is that fast reactive gut feeling. Right. Um, type two thinking is the slow, reflective, deliberative, how might this affect me five or 10 years from now kind of thinking. You can imagine that fast reactive thinking is really advantageous in sport, right? The person who can anticipate the opponent's next move, the person who can, um, you know, uh, read the defense before an opponent would understand that, right? That's how they rise to the level of this kind of competition is by honing, maybe they begin with a, you know, an edge, but then honing that fast reactive decision-making. And especially in the heat of the game or the heat of practice, right? That is the mode that you're in. You're not like paying costs and benefits. You're, you're really like in it, right? And so the idea that we're asking athletes in the heat of the game, in the heat of practice, to make a deliberative decision about their health in the context where their injury isn't obvious is a really challenging position for anyone to be in, right? And so we did a study to understand the extent to which athletes' abilities to switch between those two modes of thinking. There's a little um, survey-based test. It's the best we've got, it's not perfect, right? Um, but measuring the athlete's ability to switch between that fast reactive thinking to that slow deliberative thinking was associated with their perceptions about longer term risks to them from sport. And what we found was the athletes who had that ability to kind of like stop and switch, to turn off that fast thinking and just like take pause, were much more likely to see long term risks from their injuries in their future. Now, that's not a thing you can train somebody on, right? That is a thing that you can pull them out of a context where their brain is in that fast reactive thinking mode, right? That advantageous fast reactive thinking mode in the game. And we don't force them to make that decision in the game, right? We decide to remove them from that brain set, that mindset, and then talk to them about the health, their healthcare in a context that might more facilitate that slow deliberative thinking. We did a study with my colleagues out at the, uh, the US Air Force Academy. Um, there's been a whole literature about social norms and how that influences injury reporting behaviors. You know, I was talking earlier about how what 
an athlete thinks their teammates will think of them if they take a certain action is really influential for that action. Athletes don't always get that estimation right, right? They might think their teammates are really anti-injury reporting from, you know, maybe an observe, observation from their history elsewhere. They have some substantiation for that when in fact that's not the case. And that will alter the behavior of any individual who holds it to act in accordance or maybe more likely to act in accordance with what they think the group would want them to do. And by acting in that way, they perpetuate the cycle, right? I think my teammates don't want me to report a concussion and that's gonna influence my choice about whether I report a concussion, even if I think it's the right thing to do for myself. So because I think my teammates really don't support that behavior, I hide it. And my teammate knows that I hid it. So they think I hold the belief that hiding it is the right thing to do. Do you see what I mean? It's this cycle where um, in other areas, so this kind of work about um, pluralistic ignorance has been used a lot in binge drinking on campuses. A few people do some crazy stuff and people perceive because there's these outward visible behaviors that the crazy thing is the norm. But if you can intervene to write that social norms belief, you might not change the people who are gonna do that anyway, but you can kind of alter what people understand to be the group norm behavior. And so this is some work we're working on in the Air Force Academy to try to improve concussion reporting behavior. It's been really um, interesting and successful so far. So this is kind of athlete side, but really anybody. So this applies in the athletics context, but it's these kind of baked in decision-making things that can really influence that process of deciding how to proceed forward once an injury is diagnosed. So these cognitive biases I'm gonna label as our second challenge. Known patient preferences. So in the context of sport, um, there's going to be some challenges with how we weigh benefits and risks, right? Um, so if we think about, I'm not gonna go in order here, but this last one really sticks out to me, incommensurability, it's like a fancy phrase for like, it's hard to weigh things where there's, they're not on the same scale, right? A present social benefit versus a long-term health risk. Like you can't put units on those things, right? But that's effectively maybe what we're thinking about in measuring whether we go back today after the X, ACL injury or the X concussion. Today, I would get to play and fulfill my dreams and be with my teammates and make it to the big game. But like down the line, that could pose some different health challenges, right? And it's really hard for anyone, athletes included, to weigh those things when they're, you know, not apples to apples, right? We're apples to oranges. We also have challenges when we're thinking about today versus some other time horizon. So there's a huge literature, not in sport, but in including sport, where people, you know, value the cookie today versus, you know, the whatever tomorrow. I can hold at once the belief that, you know, it's better for me to eat a healthy diet um, for my long-term health, but then I go and, you know, have a five-course meal with Julie last night or whatever. Um, so you can hold, like, um, divergent beliefs about near and long-term things, but you tend to act in accordance with your short-term beliefs and values. The top two are really challenges on the clinician side. So we've done some work to understand the extent to which clinician, and this probably would apply to coaches as well, but they don't make a lot of these decisions, right? Whether the stakeholders around the athletes' beliefs um, influence uh, athlete healthcare. So in the first study, this is with Emily Crocious and others, um, we wanted to learn more about the nature of um, clinician risk aversion versus willingness to take risks and how that influenced how they counseled their patients and when they made a decision about maybe we need to start talking about end of career. This was concussion specific. And what we found, and maybe this is unsurprising, but I think it's important, is that the willingness to take risk of the clinician onto themselves. So I'm just kind of a risk taker by profile. 
I then counsel people in accordance with kind of my personal preferences, right? I'm a risk taker, so I'm willing, I'm more willing to let um, Maria go back into the game after her fourth concussion than my colleague might be if they themselves would not take on those risks. So that has nothing to do with athlete values, right? That's the clinician side values. And so making sure that we're aligning the discussions about athlete health with their own value preferences is really important and acknowledging that our own sets of backgrounds and experiences in that discussion can come into play and making sure we try to focus on their side of the equation is really important. And then there's a huge, again, literature about how we discuss, frame, and present risks. Risks are sort of a weird thing, right? It's all probabilistic, these, these numbers, uh, and it matters a lot whether we're talking about short-term versus long-term, whether we're framing it as a percent chance of um, a good thing happening or a percent chance of a bad thing happening, uh, and all of these kinds of framing effects, the way that you present the risk can then influence how people understand it, internalize it, and use it in their own kind of calculations. So I'm just gonna add a couple additional things to our list. We've got clinician subjectivity. I come into the decision-making process with my background experiences and risk preference profile. Risk framing. I then take all of that into my discussion about how risky or not risky the decision tree around what it is we can do for your clinical care might look like. And then this incommensurability kind of from the athlete side, but also in this discussion process about how we wanna weigh an athletics risk versus a social risk versus a health risk, et cetera, right? Those are kind of challenging mentally challenging decision-making things. So what has come into play, and this is particularly in the space of cardiovascular uh, issues related to athletics. So these can have very short-term, very severe consequences for folks. This is Aaron Dagish out of Boston, but more recently, um, some folks out of Emory as well. They're talking about shared decision-making. Now this is a thing, again, from healthcare more broadly that we've been trying to work through um, optimizing between the clinician and the patient. There are differences in how we might approach this in the athletics context, but it's a really important framework to consider as potentially helping us address some of those challenges that I just brought up. So in general, shared decision-making is this process of um, clinician elicitation of patient values, working through the diagnosis, the treatment options, and then together coming up with a treatment plan for moving forward, right? So it's a process. Um, and Bagish et al. kind of posited this as a frame shift for how we've been thinking about um, cardiovascular disease in this case, or cardiovascular yeah, disease in this case, but also we're working on a project together moving forward, applying this beyond just that process. So thinking about patient-centered care, patient-centered really focusing on the athlete. And they argue taking away some of that, what they call unnecessary paternalism or unnecessary risk aversion. So more recently, this is John Kim and Neil Dicker out of Emory. They put forward kind of a framework for thinking through this decision-making process in athletes and bringing in many of the things I just discussed in terms of the challenges, as well as some additional ones we'll kind of talk through now. So I'll say that in general, with uh, non-athletics shared decision-making, this third parties piece really doesn't apply. Maybe it does in the case of children with parents, right? But otherwise, this is sort of a dyadic relationship between a clinician and a patient. Maybe a spouse gets involved, right? Maybe a parent gets involved, but really it's a clinician-patient thing. So they raise the possibility that in the athletics context, third parties might have influence, right? We've started to talk about that, how there's this full environmental context, pressures, coaches, scholarships, et cetera. So bringing together the folks who are in the room to make that shared decision-making process, they see potential pitfalls in weighing, they raise the kind of value of athletics, lifestyle choices versus health, right? Again, that kind of incommensurability problem. The biases and heuristics in presenting those risks, we touched on some of those, 
Um, the differences in the perception and interpretation of risks by athletes. So they didn't go into it, but I think some of those things that we talked about in terms of those cognitive features that are baked into everybody, including athletes, that make those decisions challenging. And they also bring up medical legal biases. I'm not going to touch that one. I'm not aware. Okay, we're going to set that one aside. But just know that there are those kinds of considerations. And I take a risk as a clinician. There may actually be medical or medical legal consequences for me. And so they provide a couple of different options for working through these risks with the goal of making an athlete-centered uh, health-based decision. So let's talk just a moment about this third-party piece, because I think it's the one that I missed when I came up with my own list so far. Um, and it has to do with these pressures that exist in the athletics context that may and probably don't exist in most other contexts, right? These, whether it is... Um, a tr like an outwardly stated pressure, whether it's just an inwardly felt pressure, whether it comes from the athlete because they've been doing this thing their whole life, or it's really from an external stakeholder or an environment around them, right? There's both on the athlete side, as well as the clinician side, these pressures to alter the medical decision-making process from those folks around them. So back in 2015 with my colleague, Emily Crocious, Julie Sam, and some other folks, um, we looked at the extent to which clinicians, this was primarily athletic trainers, felt pressure from coaches and other stakeholders in the athletics environment to alter their medical decision-making around concussion specifically. And what we found was, yes, <laughs> um, not everyone equally though. More experienced clinicians felt uh, less often felt pressure. Um, uh, male clinicians less often felt pressure. So those lesser exp experienced and or female clinicians were the ones that really felt like other stakeholders were trying to get in the middle of this shared decision-making process or whatever version of decision-making was actually happening on the ground, right? The other thing that has come up is that the nature of the structure of athletic medicine itself can build in kind of a um, challenging structural conflict of interest, meaning, if I'm a clinician who is employed by athletics and my boss ultimately is the AD, maybe I feel a different set of pressures around my job and my decision-making maybe than if I'm a clinician who's employed by university health services but happens to work with athletes, right? And so those structural features about how um, the sports medicine organizations are set up, we've found in a different study are really uh, related to the injury profiles on campuses. So at schools where there were athletics-based sports medicine programs, we found higher rates of injury among those athletes than at schools with the uh, athletics medicine program in a medical model. So under university health services or nearby hospital. Again, there's so many factors that any one single one of these is not gonna solve any particular problem, but in certain contexts, some of these features might be easier or more challenging to address, right? So just kind of coming up with the matrix to understand which levers in your environment you might be able to pull to help make it a pro-athlete health, pro-safety environment in a way that doesn't disrupt everything else, right, is an important kind of consideration. So in optimizing the shared decision-making process, um, Cho and Dickert suggest that there's four real important questions that we consider, and I think they're really good ones. So I'm just copying and pasting from their paper here. Okay. They say we need to understand what's the range of viewpoints, and I'll say maybe the reasonable range of viewpoints among athletes regarding perception of risk, valuation of sport, and the role of the practitioner. So we need to understand more about how athletes' decision, um, decision environment and their value proposition affects their outcomes. What's the range of viewpoints among clinicians about the valuation of sport and exercise and the assessment of risk? So again, what within clinician factors lead to variation in how we present this information, how we discuss this information, and how we ultimately guide an athlete to making a decision that's right, hopefully for them? How do medical legal concerns influence and potentially bias that decision-making process? Again, I'm not going to go into that one. It's a little bit outside my wheelhouse, but you might imagine, right, if there's real concerns about risks and liabilities, that could steer you in a certain direction. And then what's the effect of various forms of framing or choice architecture, meaning how do I present the information 
what information, what ways of presenting that information is more readily received, understood, and interpreted. So we're just going to add to that list who's involved or who should be involved in that decision making process, right? Making sure that that process uh, is not unduly influenced by people who shouldn't be making decisions about athlete health and is robustly involved with those who should, right? And then ensuring that that decision making process is um, robust to the kind of challenges that we now know are part of that potential discussion. So can you yeah, go give, for it. Can you more information about like how to actually have that conversation? I mean, that's very nice to be able to say, like, let's have a discussion about our values about you know, cardiovascular <laughs> disease reporting or like risk of injury. Do they give more of like no they don't. Um, so we're actually um so uh Aaron Bagish and others, Kim Harmon at UW, um uh I'm forgetting the other other big names that are involved, have put together a registry of folks. It's called the Orca study. And they're trying to understand more about first step, like what is actually happening. Yeah. And then um, Aaron, John, John Cho, um, Neil Dickard, and I are, are putting in a grant to like work through some of just that, right? What does it actually mean to have a robust conversation eliciting athlete values? Yeah. Um, so I can see that being kind of a barrier. Like that's an idea, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a very nice statement, right? That makes total sense. But when it comes down to the practitioner, actually, Doing something with that, that seems. Yeah, and I think you know this, some of this comes back to um, kind of more the, the basics, right? You need to have an established trusting relationship with the people you're taking care of. So that's like sort of foundational, and I think you know we can easily overlook that, but that doesn't exist everywhere or with every um, clinician-patient relationship. So that's kind of the beginning, and then from there, when they walk into your office with a potentially career-altering injury, if you have that relationship. That makes that conversation, you know, probably much more easy, like easily to flow. You might already know some of the things that they're worried about or aiming towards in their career, right? All of those kinds of those kinds of things. Well, and just how it changes over time too. Yep. I mean, I mean, we know that like a lot of young athletes that have ACL reconstruction are like, yes, okay. I'm definitely going back to do to play sports, and then. Happily for the rehab, they're like, no, nope, I'm good. I don't want to go through this again, right? So, yeah, totally. Yeah. And you're right. It is, um, yeah, it's not a single time point elicitation, right? It is a process. And I think that that's a big piece that is challenging. You know, some of the work that I did around the um, athletics versus medical model, we also looked at a lot about resource allocation and like um, sports as well as everywhere else, you know, in med medicine, you know, resources aren't equitably, equitably allocated across schools and teams and genders and all of those kinds of things, right? So, you know, first you have to have enough boots on the ground to develop, to provide, you know, an adequate level of care before we're thinking about this robust shared decision-making value solicitation process. Mm -hmm. But when we're at a place where there's, you know, ample uh, resources dedicated to athletics, um, you might imagine that it's going to be the kind of place who might be a leader in thinking about implementing something like a more robust shared decision making process that centers athlete values, right? Um, yeah, but that's a, it's a, operationalizing what that means uh, is an important point that I will say is uh, in progress. Um, I think I'm towards the end, but I would love to kind of get more discussion going. So I just want to point out a couple of ethical things. One of the things that makes any of this shared decision-making stuff challenging is sports or not, this information asymmetry, right? Um, from both sides. As the athlete, I walk into the room knowing exactly how I feel. I'm going to provide some or all of that information to the clinician in front of me. As a clinician, I know from, you know, um, my personal history, as well as all of my training, how this generally goes, right? I know all of the options. I know the pitfalls and the upsides to each of them, right? And I'm going to provide the athlete with some or all of that information. And so that information asymmetry poses a lot of challenges from both sides. Um, in the non-athletics context, we typically think about it from the clinician side primarily, but in the athletics context, I think that there's some incentives that might bring into play both sides a little bit, I don't know, evenly, but a little bit more. You know, there's this autonomy versus paternalism piece, meaning we want athletes to make the decisions that are right for them, that are value enhancing, that are in, informed by their personal sets of things that they care about, that are in, sufficiently informed. 
but medicine historically has had a bit of a bent towards thinking we, they, clinicians, I'm not one, so I don't know why I say we, right, know what is best. And so it's this balance of trying to make sure we're doing right by the patient, but also centering their values and not putting them in a position where they're going to do something that hurts themselves in a way that they would regret, right? There's all of this informed decision-making piece. You know, what does that actually mean or look like in this context, right? Um, people use informed consent sometimes. I don't really think that's the right model here exactly. When we're thinking about like return to play, but you know, they don't have to know everything, right? Nobody knows everything, but what is sufficiently informed to be making this decision? How do we make sure they have the information that they need to act in accordance with their values? The pressures of competitive sport, what can we do to kind of close that door when we're in a clinical decision and be Switzerland, right? Um, acknowledging that we can't really do that, but what can we do to um, improve that process? And then this is a really different kind of decision if we're thinking about kiddos, right? Little kids, maybe with a parent involved versus adolescents, young adults, adult athletes, in a professional career. Like the, the calculus about that goes really differently in terms of we let certain groups of people, adults take on more risks than we let kids take on for themselves, right? And so how do we kind of think about gradating those decision-making processes across the age groups? And then I'll just say that this is, um, it's a team effort, right? Uh, any one clinician can make a difference in any one discussion, but really, the way that this gets incorporated more broadly is to create a culture of health and safety, is to create a process through which this becomes the norm, right? We're not just doing this as a one-off, this is part of what we do as standard of care here or somewhere, right? Trying to make sure that we're having patient-centered conversations, trying to make sure that we have a, an environment that fosters trust between the medical team and the athletics, team, the athletics uh, department. And maybe I'll just throw a pitch, you throw some research involved and make sure what you're doing is actually achieving, right, the outcomes that we're hoping for. So that's it from my side, but I would love to hear reactions, including critical ones, like hit it, hit me with it. Um, what you think, like, what did I miss? What did I skim over inappropriately? Um, thoughts, anything, um, but mostly just thank you. I think part of your autonomy versus paternalism, you know, question. I think sometimes it's not just about, you know, telling the patient what is because the establishment knows best. I think part of giving the patient the autonomy is giving them the time to process and come to the decision. I mean, I'm I'm a, a bit removed from the last time I took care of teams. I don't want to overstate, but I think dealing with some career ending injuries you just needed to give the person enough space to come to the conclusion of what their future competitive life might look like and i think when that gets challenging it isn't that someone's trying to tell them they know best it's that that acceleration of decision making that people always want well okay if so-and-so is not on the roster next year what do we do with that scholarship we have to recruit things like that when sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and mm -hmm. bite the bullet, right? I don't know. You gotta just step back and give the person space. So I think that the economy takes on a couple of different looks. That's a really good point. The second thing I would observe is I almost feel like it'd been great to have this conversation like 20 years ago, right? <laughs> but I think progressive athletic medicine places like this one, who uh, are gathering data on health related quality of life, who are doing things on patient outcomes, I think those little things aren't so little because they represent the patient's voice, right? Yeah. So the athlete has a voice and like, wow, they, they want to know how I'm doing. They want to know this beyond, you know, everything from, you know, they've done cool sleep studies here and some you know, other stuff. That, that, um, that, that, those kinds of things I think are really subtle, but they add up to, the patient having a voice, and I think that will set an. I think the environment for shared decision making might be as strong as it's been, at least in my limited experience from you know what I can recall. So those things I think are really important to set the stage for that. 
Yeah, I think that's um, a really great point. You know, a lot of the things that signal an environment of health and safety are not necessarily the things that you would think. They're those, there's, you know, some of those things that you just mentioned are examples. Oh, they care enough about my wellness to understand like how my sleep has been and whether or not that's affecting my injury profile or something like that, right? And so there are, there are a lot of things like that that put you in a position to do something like this. Um, both great comments, thank you, Andy. Thoughts, reactions? Christine, I think the, um, the debate related to medical model and structure of medical care, whether it's at the collegiate level, professional level, high school level, whatever level it is, I, I feel like there's um, administrative thoughts from that that people think, well, if we switch to a medical model, it'll just be fine. Or and whatever model it is. Yeah. And I think people lose sight of the fact that regardless of whatever system you have in place, it's the people that operate in that system and the relationships of those providers with the patients, with the organization, uh, and the other providers within the group is what matters most. And either system can be broken. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, it's, it's, it's um, really, I think it's awesome to see people that say, oh, if we switch to this model or they'll, they'll offer us more protection. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it's that simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I honestly think it's sort of, it's not even really a binary in terms of medical model versus, you know, um, athletics model. And so that's, um, I'll acknowledge an oversimplification that's necessary for things like research, right? Um, I do think though that there are some structural pieces in an environment that's um, sort of very athletics centric that when a person gets replaced or uh, a piece changes might make you more vulnerable right to the pressures that come with that context. Whereas, you know, in a kind of medical model or university health services model, again, not really, you know, sort of a false binary, you tend to be more insulated from those things. But you're right, it's not, you know, that's not the be all end all. It has a lot to do with those people and places. The idea I think is that um, people change. <laughs> cultures change for better or worse, right? So you can change within your context or you can change outside of your context, but um, creating systems that kind of insulate people from the changes we don't want to happen or empower the changes that we do want to happen can um, pro provide a little bit of protection in the direction that we want to go, if that makes sense. Um, I think the, your observation to it from uh, informed consent and certainly there's been some individuals on our campus that have done research and have strong opinions on informed consent. Uh, again, it's all a matter of how you utilize it too. Yeah. And it can be a really good piece. Um, when we put in place a number of years ago as we were training student athletes um, back from a concussion injury, doing an informed consent yeah. at the end of the treatment to create this time point of saying that, hey, we've gone through all of these steps. Do you feel comfortable returning now? Yep. It's, it's an informed consent that creates this talking point uh, and time point within their care that allows us to say, you know, here's your chance. If you don't feel ready, uh, we'll support you. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think it kind of pairs with Andy's comment really nicely about that pause, right? Um, creating those moments to pause it's sort of also related to that kind of fast and slow thinking thing where it's like, okay, like let's set everything else aside, pause, think deliberatively. Are we doing this right together? Do we both, I feel comfortable, I medical provider feel comfortable because I've checked my list. I've watched you go through these steps as far as I can tell, we're good to go. Making sure you two are on board. I really like that, that's wonderful. Yeah, other thoughts? Anybody? Yeah, I like that a lot too, the at that point, but I think recently, you know, NFL and stuff, you've seen some interesting things come up with that idea of informed decision making and adults. And, you know, I think another piece of that, the whole pressures thing is, uh, and that consent thing is cognitively, you know, especially with concussions, right? Like, are you able to understand that information and truly process it? And we don't have a good way of measuring that in people who had just sustained a concussion and saying like, no, I'm good to go back in. Like they want to, but can they really understand at, and at what point can they really process that? Is there switching from that different types of thinking happening? 
and it just really muddies the water. And then you, you hear people like, well, they're adults, they can go back and if they want to, but as a clinician, you're like, that's not yeah, safe. It's just a very muddy area. That... And Julia, the important concept that I'm referring to is one at the completion of yeah, the yeah. completion of the process. Yeah. Not, not the immediate portion. I mean, you should in those situations if yeah. you haven't gone through all the appropriate sitting on a sideline here. Yeah. No, I totally agree, but like after like the two thing, I there were people, you know. I was seeing a lot of comments, particularly not from medical people, but from people saying, well, he's an adult who can go play if he wants to. And it's like, that's not exactly how this works. But it's well, still, even, I mean, I think there's some... another layer here too. So let's set aside the cognitive piece, which I think is really important to bring up, but challenging to address, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we allow adults to make all kinds of risky decisions, but when those decisions are modeling behaviors for millions of children, mm -hmm. that also takes on another set of implications for what it is that we should or should not allow, right? And again, that's way above my pay grade, but there is like a whole other set of downstream consequences to allowing adults to make risky decisions on national television in front of a whole bunch of people, right? Yeah, definitely. No, I love that, the, like the impact you said at the end, I think is fantastic. It's great. Yes. I think in the, and not just at concussion, we've like implemented a few of these informed, you use a different term than consent, but it, it brings on the education piece too, right? Like it gives us a moment to actually, I mean, they, there's lots of time points within athletics that we say, well, use the topic of concussion and inform our athletes about concussion. Um, but there's a lot of things always going on. So like having multiple like time points to get to educate the athlete or, or like you said, like take a breather, take a break. It's not in the middle of everything starting in preseason or whatever. It's just like one more education piece and kind of like leveling, like you said, that playing field of the information of who knows what, um, which has been kind of nice too. And not just, like I said, not just that concussion, we've done it in a few other places too, where we can kind of the breather yeah let's talk through this and how it really relates to you and you in this moment because there's lots of times that we've already talked to them about that but they don't think it's going to happen to them and so it's like it just kind of flows on by and it's like okay now it actually did and so let's let's like go back over those things that might be important for helping you just like make that informed decision you know it, it's an environment that's not like any other because when we want this autonomy versus paternalism from the medical folks. But what other provide very few providers have to make a decision on a sideline in front of an 80,000 yeah. seat built stadium with maybe a television camera over your shoulder. And sometimes so we go through the space where you absolutely medical legally have to be paternalistic. So sometimes you you set up that sort of relationship for that particular injury or condition with a patient who's not real happy that you took them away. And I know a lot of them may not be truthful. It may not be truthful, right, exactly. So there's times when you you absolutely have to lean on paternalism in the interest of safety and medical legal and, and you know, some of the consequences and slings and arrows. And I'll tell you what, you know, I held, held athletes out and in hindsight, he's probably wrong. Yeah. Held athletes out and it's like, oh my gosh, thank God I didn't let that kid play. Yeah, that's okay. And, and that, so you, you sometimes start with that paternalism, and then it's through the recovery process, you have to allow the autonomy to come back. And that can be challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can challenge the relationship for sure. And that, that's really a central tension in any of this health policy making, right? We really, um, we allow people to take on all kinds of risks, but there's this balance between individual autonomy to do what it is that you want to do and like a collective responsibility to prevent injury and disease. And that's like a thing that we weigh all the time everywhere, right? I mean, see COVID, um, see, you know, like concussion protocols, see whatever it is where we just decide that there are certain things that we um, feel warrant an additional set of protections beyond just that dyadic relationship, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's a really, it's a really great point. Andy. But you know, I'm sorry, I'm losing my job, but that, the, if you if you build the trust up front, you can get by that 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 thing on pulling the person out. That that will come back because you have providers, and these are the athletic trainers. These are not the physicians who who are around a couple of evenings a week and on Saturday. 
but the, the provider who's with the patient all the time, if you if you have the trust, you'll get by that little piece of, hey, I had to take this person out, because that'll come back around. Yeah, that, that, that's not going to injure that way. Do you agree with me, Michael? Yeah, and provided that, you know, again, there, there's a support and relationship with all the other people around you, whether it's your physician at home, mm -hmm. is supportive, and you have a converging relationship there, and so your administration is a coaching staff and the patients. Yeah. Yeah, you have to have converging relationships with these piece. Any other thoughts, questions? Things that people found really interesting. I should make sure it stays in this talk moving forward. I'll take whatever I can get to. Christina, your one research related to um, medical model. Yeah. And the importance of injury rates. Yeah. It's interesting. It's almost inverse to what I would think it would be yeah. as a result. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, as you look at that, is it changes in access? Is it availability? Is it time? Yeah. Is it the system? Is it if I mean, this is a the athlete reporting feature within that. Like, yeah. I mean, I think there's some challenges there. It does hold constant um, things like uh, division of competition, the ratio of student athletes to clinicians. So the access piece should be pretty even deal. And we think it's something related to the model. But again, um, there's a lot within that piece that calls it into question. I think the other thing that any of those kinds of studies that rely on secondary data about injury rates, it's documented in diagnosed injury rates, right? Um, so we we don't can't count all the things that go go missing. You see that in SSI data where yeah. the data is just not good. Yeah. Right. That the injuries and the information they're collecting isn't uniform. It's not robust enough to make any significant decisions out of that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, 12,000 athletes, 25,000 injuries, 3.5 million athlete exposures, you can have a lot of variation <laughs> and kind of get away with some stuff when you have big enough numbers. I, I mean, it's imperfect for sure, um, but I, uh, it's sort of the best we've got. And yeah, so, no, um, the only is yeah, right now, so yeah, yeah. So. but it's, uh, yeah, I, I think there, there are room for improvements for sure. Anything else? Thank you so much, Christine. Oh, did you have a question? Do you have a question? I'm here. All right. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. I'm sorry, Jason. Please. Oh, yeah. I can stick around. I don't know. Okay. I learned a lot.